Welcome to OK Smart Ass. This is the show where we put technology under the microscope. In this episode, I feel good about sending myself messages. I have my Christmas readings sorted with 15,000 letters from Charles Darwin and they're printing 3D body parts in space. Now time to look at what's happening in technology, innovation and the gadgets that make our lives so much more exciting. Hi, I'm Patrick Bonello. And I'm Tor Roxburgh. I'm a writer and a reader and someone who loves change and future-focused thinking. Patrick, I'm thinking of three family members at the moment, two hips and one knee. If only they'd waited. I'm a journalist and I have a marketing and graphic design business and Tor, will I have to go to space to replace my body parts? No, Patrick, the answer is no. You can still get a really good job done in hospital, but... They are printing a knee in space. This is so interesting that they're sending a 3D printer mm. to the International Space Station mm. to do a 3D print yeah. of a knee joint. Yeah. And you think, why? I, I had to have a little wonder about why. And apparently when you 3D print things, the, the goo, whatever the goo is, you know, in this case, kind of some sort of biologically neutral substance okay <laughs> um it 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 flops you know gravity you know gravity gravity yeah. yes yeah. and we all know about an older yeah. in older yeah. age <laughs> and uh so when you do it in space it, you get a kind of a cleaner result oh is that what it is i mm. oh, see because i thought depending on what you're doing because when you 3d print you've got a level as well so i guess it depends on the type of 3d printer because if you're using a filament printer mm. the filament printer layers from the bottom up but then you can get others that sit in a gel and you use lasers to print. Yeah, no, it's no. not the laser oh, okay. type. It's the accumulation, accumulation type. type. I that's not the right additive, probably. No, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so a lot of things, it's interesting that they're looking at, I guess, all sorts of things that are going to be adaptable in space. And in, in the long term, it does have benefits here on Earth. But I guess looking forward to travelling further out into our solar system, maybe? Yes. Well, there's lots of stories this episode about, you know, things we need to do if we want to travel further out into um, our solar system. Well, this company called Redwire is hoping to 3D print whole organs in space. Now, that's a long-term goal. And I think, you know, when we talk about the whole idea of printing and reprinting or regrowing our own organs yeah. is the tissue compatibility thing. And we've, we've discussed that many times on the show. So there's a lot to be said about creating organs from our own tissue. Yeah. But in this case, if it's a neutral matter, you know, we've been doing hip replacements and knee yeah, joints yeah, and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting. You know, I had a, a story and I don't know if we, ta we chatted about this during the week. Um, an, an elderly friend of mine um, had a knee replacement mm. and he was quite infirm. And at the same time, another friend who was in the same age category had exactly the same knee replacement at the same time, but she was doing yoga and was, for her age, was really dynamic and really adaptable and, and all that sort of thing. But interestingly enough, hers was the traditional re knee replacement where they make, you know, they, they look at the knee joint, they say it's about this size, they do measurements, yeah. whereas his was a scan and a 3D print. Wow. His recovery was half the time of the other person, and yet he was the infirm one, and the other person was the healthier person. Yes, yes. Mind you, we can't um, conclude that's a causal oh, come on, relationship. Just... <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, it was interesting that the, the 3D print... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I might be jumping to conclusions. Oh, look at you fact-checking. Like, God. <laughs> but it is interesting. I've got to say, what a contrast going from printing body parts and helping humanity to war in space. Yeah, tell us I mean, about I don't even this, know what the segue Patrick. is here. Yeah. So this is really kind of scary. Military experts, at the moment, there's this kind of big powwow going on. In fact, in Australia, some senior military people have been getting together. So they're in Sydney, which um, is uh, a big, major Australian city, which we found out recently. Yeah, is not a, we went there. We did go there. <laughs> it's almost as, it's almost, Melbourne's almost as big as Sydney now. Yes. We had a, uh, an argument with an Uber driver who said that Sydney was so much bigger. And said Sydney had 8 million people. Which and it doesn't. Is, no. No. So. Um, also, we should say, because we said, oh, we're finalists last oh, episode, yeah. we're still finalists. Yes. 
we're we not winners. We, no, no. Well, we're <laughs> winners in our in our own hearts. Yeah, we, yeah. So <laughs> still finalists in the best. Hey, thanks to all our listeners category. who voted for us and, and supported us. We got so many messages yeah. from people. It was really lovely to have, and we even got a write up in our local newspaper. Yes. <laughs> that yes. was kind of fun as well. Yes, everybody so, I meet in the street at the moment goes, "How'd you go?" Oh, yeah, I know. And then you say, <laughs> "Well, actually, we had a great time." Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it was an amazing experience. But so yeah. anyway, getting back to our um, Uber war driver in space. Oh, oh, war in space. Okay. Okay. Oh well, either one. It was, yeah, that's yep. right. No, we, we were we were kind of looking at what does that mean because, as I said, this this strategic senior mil- military leaders are getting together at the moment in Sydney, mm-hmm. and it's called the Strategic Policy Institute Conference, mm-hmm. and there's real concerns that um, when we think of a war in space, we're not talking Star Wars. Or no. Star Trek, okay? We're not talking battleships firing at each other and all that sort of stuff. What we are talking about is knocking out satellites. Yeah, grappling arms. <laughs> Grappl- okay, yeah, grappling arms, yes, yeah. that's that's a possibility yeah. too, or ramming. ramming um, but yeah. the, the reality is it's hard to envisage how much we rely on satellite technology. The very fact that we can do a podcast, we can upload it, that's all because of satellite technology. Communications, GPS, what would happen tomorrow... I mean, I, I can't even read a malway anymore, no. <laughs> like a street directory. Um, but the reality of it is now we we rely on our telecommunications to make phone calls, to navigate. And if you think about it, even emergency services, you know, um, ambulances, first mm. responders, so much banking, of our infrastructure. Power banking, grid, yeah. Yes. I mean, it's not as though we couldn't manage without our satellites, but to have them all wiped out in one, well, you know, in a series I don't know. of No, hits. I don't agree. I, I think that we couldn't manage without our satellites. Well, I Navigation. mean, we could rebuild... Is oh what yeah, I'm yeah, saying. yeah. But if but they were we'd knocked be out, in real trouble. We would be in real trouble. Yeah. We, I mean, navigation. If we think of even being able to navigate on the high seas, yes. if you're going from A to B, that's all d- dependent now. I can't imagine someone on the bridge of a ship with a sextant no. and looking at the stars. <laughs> I mean, come on. I was thinking we'd go back to that. No oh, trouble. Really. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a serious one. And yeah. so they're saying that because Russia has just demonstrated by destroying one of its yeah, own satellites. Yeah. yeah, it demonstrated that and it's China. able to do it. And China, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of space junk up there. But, um, you know, the banking is so much. I, I kind of, it's staggering what we are now relying on satellites for. And then there are a lot of people in rural areas now who rely on it for communications. Um, you know, Elon Musk's satellite system and it means internet's getting to people where it never did before. And precision, precision agriculture. Oh, like yes. Like deciding how much water to use exactly, how to seed, you know, exactly when to harvest, all those things. Drunk farmers now can drive their tractors because it's GPS run. <laughs> no, they're not really drunk. I, I have so much respect for farmers. I don't know how they do it. How they're did you amazing. Say that, I know. No, but when you see the fields that they plough, they can now map out exactly so that they're more accurate and it means less fuels being used. Yeah. It's more economically viable, but also uh, more beneficial to the environment. Yeah. So we would be in trouble, and I'm glad they're having a chat about it. Oh, me too. Yeah. Me too. I don't know what the solution is. Well, I, I, I do think that like we do need to de-escalate the hostility in the world, don't we? And obviously, mm. war in Russia, war with Russia is a, a problem. It is. Yeah. On a more positive note, I've been really excited by the Orion spacecraft Um so at the moment, of course, the Artemis mission, this is the first Artemis yeah, mission. Yeah, the rocket took off. The rocket took off and the Orion craft is on board. And it's, uh, it then, you know, basically the whole Artemis mission is, is amazing because it's everything that is basically returning us to the moon. And I say that in general terms. Mm-hmm. So 2024, I think, is the, the next launch date for a manned or personed mission. Yes, they, yes. They, they, Do they even know who the... Astronauts are going to be yet? Yeah, probably not. I don't know. I haven't That'll be interesting. That. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, in fact, I was just on a slight tangent. I think the International Space Station, that the International Space Station, is about to get its first disabled astronaut. Is it? Yeah, I thought oh. that was really touching. I, I think that's awesome. Mm. So the Orion now has flown farther than any other spacecraft that's been designed to carry humans. Okay, because mm. of course the Voyager spacecraft have almost left the so- pretty well left the solar system yeah. now, haven't they? And the previous record was Apollo 13 in, oh. I think, 1970. It, 70, yeah, about the... Yeah, se- yeah, 1970. And that record was made because they had a little explosion yeah. and they had to change the... 
trajectory. To sh- slingshot around the moon. Yeah. So that get, was yeah, get to get back, back to, to Earth. Earth. Yeah. yeah, That was cool. it was an amazing movie too, the Tom Hanks film. Did mm. you watch it? Did you see it? Yes. Yes, it's worth I watching. Do. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah. So this is kind of interesting, this 24-day mission, because it's a real, you know, get out there and test the systems. Mm. I was interested to note, though, um, when they had just taken off, the media had been banned from taking photographs of the launch platform. Did you hear that? No. D- in case it blew up or, or what? No, 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 no. Just after it, they, they'd actually been damaged because oh. this is the most powerful rocket in history and evidently oh. they kind of underestimated what it would do to the uh, launch platform. So okay. they since have let the media back in and they said, yeah, yeah. there was damage done oh. to it because okay. I think it's going to be launching SpaceX as well, some uh, right. other... Right. Yeah. So yeah. interesting, isn't it? Um, so the Orion should splash down on December the 11th. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do we know where? Uh, oh, I shouldn't just ask questions. Off the coast of San Diego, she reads. Oh, there you go. The notes. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to have notes. Yeah. All. Look, um, the, Patrick, the, talking about space, there was a very interesting, very long article in Wired by Brendan Corner about hibernation in space. And, you know, all the science fiction readers are completely familiar now with, you know, going into suspension and then Well, of being, course. That's I the mean, only way being, you're going to yeah. travel those distances. But mm-hmm. I've always thought about it in terms of, you know, travelling those distances and the time taken. But the real problem is weight. And I hadn't... Sorry, thought. were you just looking at me when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if we are going to Mars by 2040 and say you take a crew of four... You'd need 11 tonnes of food. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's the issue, is getting enough sustenance yeah. for everybody. Look, for, yeah. for interstellar travel, yeah. obviously time is also the issue. But weight is a yeah. huge issue. Mm. So people, people, NASA and the US military have been looking at hibernation. And at first they were looking at that... Therapeutic hibernation, you know, you um, people will have probably read popular stories about this, that occasionally when someone has been found, um, you know, drowned or a soldier's been in- injured in a very cold climate, they've been able to be revived with remarkably less damage than expected right. under certain c- cold conditions. So they've found out that, you know, if you chill people in cardiac arrest down to 89 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 32 Celsius, to re- it reduces the oxygen needed by the cells and, and helps with healing. But the problem with therapeutic um, hibernation, hibernation <laughs> right. is... Or shiv- hypothermia, yeah, isn't is, it? Is yeah, is sh- shivering and, and people need to be given really strong drugs to stop the shivering and ah. that's that's a problem if you're going to use that method but then there were these curious animal models like we know lots of animals hibernate and there's this arctic squirrel that hibernates for eight months a year at you know 27 degrees fahrenheit which is minus 2.8 degrees celsius like it's really frozen wow. and then it yeah. wakes up again in great health and people have started, well, various researchers have started to wonder, well, we share a common ancestor. Could that be a way forward for human beings? So they're comparing us to a squirrel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one option is to, you know, tweak our genes, possibly turn on things that are not getting turned on Oh, anymore. so they're dormant. So hibernation could be a dormant already yeah, it, in our genes. Yeah, maybe. switching it on. Yeah. <gasps> wow. Yeah. Huh. Um, and then there's some other researchers who are working out combinations of different drugs to, to make that temperature drop into hibernation um, possible without doing damage to our hearts. What about if you were one of those people who just thought, you know, the 2030s are going to be so boring, let's just yeah. sleep through that and yeah. then wake up in the 2040s? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, there's long been that dream that, like, <laughs> if you had some incurable disease, you'd yeah. just be put into suspended animation. Cryogenic until suspension, yes. yeah. Yes, which cryogenics had its moment. Well, it still does. I think people still really? freeze their heads and things like that. <laughs> like, 
You think who's going to bother with an old head <laughs> in the future? <laughs> I don't know. Would you? Well, would I guess? Does this something? Oh, I wonder if all the people, and I believe Walt Disney was another person who who froze. was froze, cryogenically yeah, frozen. I'm not sure. Yeah, um, but when you think about it, I wonder if the people who get frozen are atheists. Oh, I don't know. Because when you think about it, right, mm. if you're facing impending death, but you have a strong religious viewpoint mm. that you're going to mm. die and go to heaven. Yes. Whereas if you're an atheist, and I am, um, mm. I, I don't think there's anything after death. Mm. So if there's a potential that I could be frozen and mm. at some point maybe regrow all my organs yeah. and transplant my brain into a fresh, healthy new me. Well, that might be the better option rather than hibernation for interstellar travel. I mean, maybe your consciousness is uploaded yep, and then you just grow in a fresh body well, when you get to the other end. That, yes. Well, then the other episode, we, we just in our last episode, we talked about travelling virtually yeah. and inhabiting the body of a robot. Yes. So... In a lot of ways, and I, I was reading a scientific Wi-Fi article. Wi-Fi problems. Yeah, <laughs> yes, true. No, but I, I was having a conversation, well, not having a conversation, I was reading an article about a scientist who was just saying, why are we even sending people back to the moon mm. when we can do it all by remote control? Mm. You know, we've got rovers, we've got artificial ways of doing that. Do we physically need to stand on the moon to do all the things we want to do? Yeah, I don't know. I think the answer is no, but no, yes. No, it's probably emotionally. We it's very to, emotional, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay, because we could do it all by remote control, let's face it. Yeah. Yeah. So a big meteorite was um, located in South oh, Australia. Oh, not just a meteorite, a meteorite field. Yeah. So I'm not sure if the meteorite basically... It shattered. Broke, shattered, and yeah. then all the fragments have been spread. But this mm. is amazing. So scientists have mapped out the fallings, what they call a fall zone, of a six ton asteroid so it's probably a good thing that it broke apart yeah. um, and it crashed through the atmosphere and it's now left a, a, a whole field in South Australia full now this is um, it basically landed back in 2013 so they're only just finding out now mm. um, of all these little fragments and it's out near Port Augusta is that right yeah, yeah. that's right six kilometre long stretch yeah it's so interesting isn't it and recently just this month, a team of researchers in Canada have taken a slice of a meteorite that fell in East Africa and they have discovered two new minerals and possibly a third. Minerals that they, I think they, I think I read that they had kind of synthesised in Earth but never realised that could occur naturally. Oh, wow. How yeah. interesting is that? Well, you know what was also interesting is um, I was reading an account of what to look for when you're looking for asteroids. And in Port Augusta, mm. the, the, generally the soil and the sand has a kind of a light-coloured consistency and a look, mm. whereas the meteorite fragment, fragments are quite of a dark brown colour, not yeah. dissimilar to kangaroo poo. Oh. <laughs> so the trick is, if you pick it up and it's mushy, then, <laughs> then it's then not a meteorite. <laughs> but that's the difference. So it yeah. looks a lot like kangaroo poo. Yeah. And there's a lot of it in Australia, yeah. I can tell you. There's a lot of it in our area, for that exactly. matter. Exactly. <laughs> now, I've got my Christmas reading sort of talk. Yes, Charles Darwin. 15,000 letters. I mean, how many letters did wow. that Wow, did that man write? ever that's... stop writing? I was thinking, how many letters have I written in my life? And it, it's probably a couple of hundred because I went to boarding school and we were made to write oh, you, home. Oh, I see. Right. Um, every week we well, had to write home. But talking about how prolific he was, okay, it was over a fair amount of time, but 1882 to, sorry, 1822 to 1882. So in 60 years, mm. he wrote 15,000 letters. Mm. It got me thinking though, right, it was Charles Darwin. And he said some profound things. Yes. But but do you think he might have had, like, dear water authority, I think you overcharged me in my last bill. You know, that's a letter. Yeah. Right? What, and, was and it all these letters? that tells you something about a person's character, so that's not unimportant. You don't reckon? No, that's part of the social research, isn't it? Oh, is it? Um, oh, the cultural What research. about letter to the editor of the Times newspaper? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. object to that person who says that there is yeah. no such thing as... Yeah. As, well, as, you know, as, as fish walking on two legs. Yeah, but seriously, <laughs> yeah. Patrick, I mean, this is a way that we can all get a one-to-one -one relationship with the past and with documents that normally 
you know, only historians have access yeah. to. Yeah, this is part of the Internet Archive, which yeah. I absolutely love yeah. because it means all of those letters are now publicly available when mm. you go to the Internet Archive and you can see them. And, and seriously, it's giving us a really interesting picture of what Darwin's life actually was mm. like because you can see through his correspondence, and I think... You know, f we send text messages and it would be interesting to profile, say, yourself or myself. If we looked at your WhatsApp, your um, text messaging, yeah. the things that you say via your electronic communications, yeah. you probably would get a fair picture of who you are. And, and there and might be 15,000 of them. There you go. Especially so you're up there with you're Darwin. sending messages to yourself. Nice segue. Oh, the yeah. nice segue. <laughs> Very nice. Now, I'm feeling vindicated here yeah. because I like the idea. I, I actually talk to myself constantly. I talk to my Google Home yeah. um, and I send messages constantly to myself. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that not only are people doing this as a good way to have reminders, but now it's become official that WhatsApp is making it easier to message yourself. Yes, and it's being rolled out. It's not this new feature which puts message to yourself at the top of your contact list when you start typing a message. No, it's not on my phone yet. I had it checked this Oh, you did, morning. did you? Okay. Well, it's yeah. been rolled out at the moment. Yeah. So what it will mean is that um, you can send yourself reminders and shopping lists. And, and voice memos. Voice memos, that sort of yeah. stuff. So this is reported on really TechCrunch. Handy. I think it is. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's just basically it's called Message Yourself. Yeah. And it was. Um, it's only just, as you say, being rolled out. But you'll be able to see all, you know, at the top of your contacts eventually, it'll be you. Yeah. Yep. So people are often sending themselves emails, but this is probably a a faster, easier way to contact your, your future self. I, I kind of scare myself sometimes when I look at my calendar because I add lots to my calendar for me. Yeah. And so when I wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, I speak to Google and I ask Google to start adding notes to my calendar. Mm -hmm. And then when I get up and look at my calendar in the morning, there's it's just all these like squares of notes. Random. Yep. <laughs> Half asleep thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, look, so I think there you go. It's a whole different way of looking at how to remember things and mm. not forget stuff, which is something we all cope with. We've got so many distractions going on in our, our lives. So uh, I often think how fortunate we are to be able to interact in the world via technology. And because I have this gig at the Australian Tennis Open, we work with a number of um, organisations. Uh, Vision Australia is one that we work mm -hmm. with, and I love working with Vision Australia because our commentators give the most rich, dynamic commentary of what's happening at the tennis. Mm -hmm. And Vision Australia takes that because, of course, people who are vision impaired can still be Enjoy sport fans. Tennis. They love yeah. tennis, exactly. We get, we, yeah. Yes, well, actually, there's a very, very big audience out there. So, but I, I, there's a new tech out there called iDaptic, and they've got a new announcement, and it's um, i5 ultralight smart glasses. So, what it does is, if people have low vision, it augments their vision. Mm. So, Just, in live stream, it mm. brings, it, it captures images. And it, but it doesn't just capture images, it enhances them. So we are talking like a projection, aren't we? Really? It is, it, so the glasses actually, yeah. um, they enhance sight for people who are vision impaired. So and you can tweak it for your particular yes, vision Yes, exactly, so precisely. Yeah. So if you have issues with certain aspects of your vision and say, for example, you, know, you don't have good peripheral vision, yeah. this could probably assist yeah. with that as well. This morning when I read this story, I said, Will, Will, this is for your mum because they talk about macular degeneration and I described it to him and he said she has enough trouble with her computer <laughs> <laughs> if it involves any kind of tweaking and yeah. fiddling with to get it... But, but look, we haven't seen it. It might be really straightforward no. once you set it. Yeah, and this yeah. so the, the glasses themselves have external cameras, mm. and that's what's taking in the viewscape. So they they put it, they're quite light, and they because they ha they they the tech is just the screens, and then they use a smartphone, so it kind of apps to the smartphone, yeah. and they're able to control it from there. But then again, for older people having to use yeah. the smartphone, I mean that. That can be problematic. Look, I, I wonder if it's a little bit like hearing aids, though. If you have the right people setting it up for you in the first yeah, place, it could be good. then it could be really revolutionary for people who um, who kind of s struggle with vision issues. Yeah. And, well, even if you think about, you know, reading something or navigating, walking around, being able to just move around in the world, we take it for granted if we're sighted mm. and we have good sight. But this is, I love it. I love the idea of tech being used in this way. Mm. Mm. Now, I, you've got to explain this one. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> 
start You're not even with this saying medical a word. Stuff. No, okay. no, because I'm going to put my foot in it uh, if I do. <laughs> yeah, look, I think that's all right. You know, we've talked on this show about um, poo. Yeah. We've talked about lungs. We've talked about brains. We've, I think we've talked about penises. Mm, but we've talked about testicles and, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> contraceptives that have to be yes, injected. Yes, that, that was actually yeah. last episode. Yeah, go for okay. it. Okay. So I think we can talk about um, bacterial problems in vaginas. Yeah, I, absolutely. And vaginas on a chip. I mean, this is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I... <sighs> I just can't see it. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm really biting my tongue here. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a free-form conversation. Okay. You're allowed to say anything. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. No, I'm, yep. Okay. So, we're, all right. So, this is an interesting one where we can... And we've talked a lot about combining tech with, with physical bodies. Yeah. And so, what, how, how does Look, this work? I think that what we need to understand here is that there are various ways of studying treatments and very often people are using animal modi- models so yeah. they're they're doing experiments on mice or they might be you know growing cells in a in a petri dish and they might be testing things on those cells but the missing link is not being able to experiment on living humans, humans yeah so when we talk about a brain on a chip or lungs on a chip and now vaginas on chips, um, <laughs> what we're talking about is something constructed with living tissue that mimics a vagina or a lo- bit of lung or a bit of brain. So in the case of the lungs, they're constructing lung tissue, airflow, but also the vascular flow yes. on the other side. So when they test drugs... They're seeing how all those things interact. So they're the same place that has been doing the lungs on a chip, the Vice Institute at Harvard, mm. have been doing the vaginas on a chip. And it's interesting to point out, though, that one of the realities of this these bacterial issues, so what happens is in irritable bowel syndrome, there's a lot of issues that premature people birth. have. Premature birth. It, it can actually relate to bacteria yeah, and the talking- spread of bacteria on the surface of whatever the you know, part of the body we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Now, I, I was staggered, 30% of reproductive aged women around the world um, are actually affected by bacterial vaginosis. Yes, and yeah. not all going on at forever at the same time. No. These are episodes. Right. So we're not talking about thrush, which is a yeast mm. in infection. We're talking about um, a, a bacterial growth that that gets out of balance because you, you it's a biome. The yeah. vagina, just like the gut, has a healthy biome. And sometimes it does, um, you know, get out of whack. So the most common one is Gardnerella vaginalis, which famously smells like rotting fish. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> and that kind of upsets things in the vagina and allows in all sorts of other problems that can lead to things like premature birth and, mm. you know, bigger health problems. But I'm going to tell you a funny story. Okay. I've only had this once in my life. It was when I was living in Brighton and I was at home on my own and there was a tradesperson coming over and I was getting ready for the tradesperson to come. And there was this terrible smell. I was in the kitchen of rotting fish. I thought there's some, there's some garbage somewhere this is so embarrassing, the tradesperson's going to smell it. And I'm going around looking for the source of the smell, but of course not realising I'm the source of the no. smell. <laughs> wow, this is taking a really interesting personal tone today. <laughs> and I'm looking and it's here, but it's also over here. Wait a minute, it keeps following me. <laughs> it's following me. <laughs> that, I, thank you for that insight, Tor. I, I think it's really... This is probably the most intimate discussion we've had on our podcast. But I think that, that it's 30% of people. You know, yeah. that's quite a lot. We're almost talking one in three yeah, will be affected by this sort of thing. And, it in, you know, these these types of imbalances increase your risk of catching sexually transmitted diseases. Yes. This yeah. is really serious stuff. Yeah. And normally it's treated with antibiotics um, and, you know... Finding better treatments is a really good idea. It costs. Looking for probiotics that yes. enhance the 
the buy-on. You know the cost is $4.8 billion in treatment wow. every year. Wow. Yeah, so it, it, we're talking a lot of money. And as you say, there are risk factors uh, in terms of you know yeah. having a sexual partner as yeah. well. And yeah. yeah. So there's lots of really good reasons that they're combining tech with this kind of grafting, growing process. Yeah. It's so fascinating. And it I is, guess it, it makes sense, whatever part of the body you can grow and yeah. graft. Yeah, if you can make a model that's really yeah. a living model, mm. it, you're helping all those poor mice who are getting experimented on. And also apparently um, animal biomes in their vaginas are very different yeah. from humans. And we, this is also the controversy. We know how many mice and rats are tested but the reality of it is they are different enough from us yeah. that we sometimes wonder about the viability and the benefit mm. of all this research when we've got an animal that is similar but not that similar. And that's the challenge, isn't it? So the more we can do specific testing related specifically to our, you know, our, our actual genome, our, yeah. our, di- you know, our DNA, ourselves, our bodies, mm. and then less animals are going to be killed as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm in so favour. So it's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. I... Have also been stunned about this next story um, because this is an interesting segue given what we've just spoken about. (laughs) (laughs) Go for it, Patrick. An electronic tongue (laughs) that mimics human taste buds. Mm. Mm. So, (laughs) look, I didn't choose the order of these stories. This was random, people. This was. It was really random. So um, the thing is. You know, you wouldn't taste a rotten anything, would you, to measure, no. you know, the taste of it? Would you know, no. no one wants to do that. Um, so, you know, if it was a rotting piece of meat or something, um, but there could be a benefit in tasting yeah. that um, and and doing that electronically. So, um, the idea of getting an electronic tongue to taste things that we all <laughs> wouldn't want to taste mm. makes a lot of sense. Mm. And so, it's an e tongue, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yes. So um, they've produced it and um, now we don't have to taste off meat to know it's off. Right. I I mean, I just feel for all those people sitting at court with all the monarchs that made them eat the food before they did. And oh, then, yeah, you know, because yeah, you know, yeah. that was a real thing during mm. uh, for, forever, mm. um, you know, Reigning monarchs would would make people taste for, taste poison. for food, taste for poison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you could do it electronically. Yeah. Uh, do you do you worry about that? I mean, uh, I think um, no. Your partner does most of the cooking oh, at your yeah, place. But like, <laughs> I grew up in a household where when the chop looked a gr- bit green, Mum used to wash it in some vinegar and water. Oh God, really? Yeah, but that's kind of like that. That sounds really bizarre to us now, but like in older times, people used to do that. Wow. Mm. Okay. Because salt and vinegar is probably the worst tasting chip flavour ever. Mm. I've got nothing to do with anything we've spoken about, but I just thought <laughs> I'd bring that up because I don't like it. Yeah. Now, Twitter, misinformation. Mm. Well, during the COVID pandemic, which I guess is still going on, if you live in China, it certainly is, mm. um, there was a lot of talk um, about misinformation. And, and so Twitter was, and Twitter was very it. proactive or seemed to be very proactive. Well, Evidently, it's now disappeared. So the suggestions that they're now no longer moderating. So Elon Musk's kind of jumped into the show, but he went and sacked a whole lot of people. Mm. So is that because there are no moderators left or there's very few moderators and so they, they can't do it? Because, you know, their internal statistics say that during since 2020, 11,000 accounts were suspended for that very reason. Mm. Donald Trump. <laughs> now, I just wondered... Just taking the the counter counter position, mm-hmm. does it matter? Like already, the world is already divided into its pandemic camps. Like mm. the people who think that they're going to get microchipped by Bill Gates, <laughs> <laughs> like they already think that. Right. So what you're saying is, is that it doesn't really maybe matter. Maybe it doesn't matter if- like it did during the early days. I mean, it'll matter again if there's a new wave with a very different variant. Look, I I don't know. Um, I love the idea of people having a voice and being able to speak out on any topic that they want and a freedom of being able to speak out. And I don't want anyone to be gagged. However, we know that there are people 
and groups that want to twist messages and want to spread misinformation. Mm. You know, that's how elections get swayed. Mm. But I'm just suggesting that people are already in their fixed positions. Well, I, I don't, don't agree. Well, we right. just had recently had a state election and we know there are swinging voters. Mm. We know that there are people who rock up to an election and do not know who they're going to vote for mm. until they get to the polling booths. Mm. Now, if you can sway them on social media, and we saw this with Brexit. Mm. So there's a lot of information now circulating saying that potentially in Brexit, whilst Brexit was going on, it was a lot of propaganda that swayed the decision for the Brits to leave the EU. Mm. Um, and that was a direct result of, of propaganda spread on social yeah. media. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm all in favour of moderation. Uh, um, yeah, not just in favour of moderation <laughs> in general, in favour of content moderation. Yes. I just thought in the pandemic case yeah. it might be slightly different now. Yep. I mean, the other thing we could do is just not post anything and get AI to do it for us. Yes, and do well, probably. Oh, really well. Yeah. So they've used, we've been talking about AI doing pictures yep. and, and generating the most amazing images. Mm -hmm. But, oh, and I also noticed recently, Tor, you might be interested in this, that some of the open, I think Dali, Dali is now no longer uh, using the algorithm whereby you can type in, make my painting look like a Van Gogh. Okay. So they're trying to protect the intellectual property of a style of oh, okay. artwork. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Dali. It was one of those AIs. Yeah. But they're saying now that you can't try to subsume somebody's style yeah, yeah. in whatever artwork you're getting the artificial mm. intelligence mm. to generate. Okay. So that was kind of interesting, wasn't it? Yes. Although they should distinguish between people who've been dead for... Yeah, I think you know, so, because I've got a really great picture of a schnauzer drinking a milkshake um, in a Van, Van Gogh, Gogh style. style. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm doing a T-shirt so for I myself for Christmas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so this... Poetry now. Poetry. So, okay, so this is an article that came out, I think it was on, um, on Hacker News. Have you heard of that? No. No, okay. Um, so it, it's interesting that this... It's called GPT-3, and they have designed a AI that can write short rhyming poetry. Mm -hmm. So they set a challenge and they wanted to get this AI to do some poetry about Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. And it's yeah. a really good poem. Yeah, well, I You don't mean, think so? I don't know. It's a really good poem at all. But um, it does rhyme here and there. <laughs> I, it's only short. Why don't you read it? Patrick? Okay. If you want to understand Einstein's thought, it's not that hard if you give it a shot. General relativity is the name of the game where space and time cannot remain the same. Mass effect, the curvature of space which affects the flow of time's race, an object's motion will be affected by the distortion that is detected. The closer you are to a large mass, the slower time will seem to pass. The farther away you may be, time will speed up for you to see. Yeah. That's good. I oh, like that's it. That's cute. And um, <laughs> you don't, you know, if you use um, AI, you don't have to bother learning about Einstein's theory of relativity to get the poem written. And mostly it rhymes. But I think poets would say... I mean, it, you can imagine this in a classroom. Yeah. could be used like in a classroom. Year eight class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I think poets would say that that it's missing a lot of the things that make a poem a poem. Yeah, um, yeah. and probably heart and soul. <laughs> <laughs> but good. Yes, yeah. okay. So yeah. I thought it was pretty clever and I, 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 yeah, I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Cash for comments. Yes. Now, you, you and I well, both have Pixel phones. Yeah, You've got a five, I've got a six. Yeah. And Google has been caught out when they released the Pixel 4. They enticed a whole crap load of people to make positive comments about the new phone. And now they've been caught out. So the Pixel 4 came out and that was in 2019-20. And there's a lawsuit that says that basically radio personalities, effectively cash for comments, were used to promote the handset. 29,000 deceptive wow. endorsements wow. were made in that time. So they've been fined $9.4 million in penalties yeah. for doing the whole cash for comments so thing. the problem is that they didn't distinguish between an ad and a personal mm. review. 
Yes. No. Oh, yeah, I guess it was... No, they're saying it was deceptive because they were made... The, the, yeah, the, I guess they were ads, but they were not... Dressed in, up as a, as a... As a review and saying, this is a great phone, I love it, and then yeah. they're being paid to do it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not the first or the last time that this has happened. No, just but, the big caught out. <laughs> but interesting that Pixel felt it needed to do that because, you know... We've enjoyed our pixels, haven't we? Oh, I, I, yeah. I love it. And I still think value for money, it's yeah. one of the best phones yeah. on the market. And I did pay for mine. Yeah. But, so. And we <laughs> wish someone would pay us for comment. That'd no, be good. I'm but... joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is one of those things that uh, I guess – this this was really controversial in Australia quite a few years ago. Probably yeah. about was it about ten years ago yeah. or so, yeah. where people were making political statements and statements yeah. about big corporations and showing favoritism to them. Yeah, and uh, under the guise of journalism. Yes, and yeah. that wasn't. I think journal- that's the yeah. point. I, I think that's 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 what it's about. Yeah. It's being um, yeah. you know totally the idea being that you know if you're doing a credible program, if, particularly if it's a you know, current affairs mm. type program or in, in the case of a radio host, mm. you'd like to think that if they're giving an endorsement, yes. that's... Um, and, and what I like about a lot of reviews, that they people are very clear up front that they have been given this... Yes, and, for and free. For free, yeah. yeah. And so that can influence people. Yeah, mm. yeah. And we need to know what's a sponsorship, what's an ad... Yes. ...and what's actually proper journalism. Yeah. Yep. And we're in none of those categories. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been listening to OK Smart Ass, the podcast brought to you by a nerd and a smart ass. I'm Patrick Bonello, and you can contact us by visiting our website at OKSmartAss.com or email nerds at OKSmartAss.com. I'm Tor Roxburgh. If you like getting suggestions for books, podcasts and viewing, you can find my newsletter via my Facebook and Instagram profiles. We'll see you again in the next episode. If you'd like to help the show, please tell a friend, share a post online or take the next step and support us via Patreon. Just go to patreon.com forward slash OKSmartAss to sign up. And a big thank you to our Patreon supporters and our listeners who get in touch. If you like what we do, make sure to hit the subscribe button and share with your friends.